by Focus Fund. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Words, words, words. I'm so sick of words, said the eminent English economic analyst Eliza Doolittle. And the former flower girl could easily have been talking about the American economy in 2001. Let's start with the word recession. Are we in one right now? Well, it depends on whom you ask. In Silicon Valley, which owned the investing world for years, but can hardly get arrested today, it's a recession and then some. Reminding us of the old story that a recession is when your neighbor loses his job, a depression is when you lose your job, and a panic is when your wife loses her job. Not just in the technology area, but in much of manufacturing and other old line economic sectors, layoffs and the threat of more to come have created an unambiguous feeling of recession now. But if you take the traditional shorthand test, which requires two consecutive quarterly declines in national growth, we haven't even come close. This week's report on 2001 second quarter was the most anemic since 1993, but it still showed some positive movement at an annual rate of seven-tenths of one percent. And that means we're not even halfway to an identifiable recession. Now, the official arbiters of American economic cycles over at the National Bureau of Economic Research have always rejected that two-quarter test as simplistic, preferring to retire like the College of Cardinals into secret consultations and then indicate with a puff of authoritative smoke whether and when we are in recession. It's the word that stirs the emotions, but the reality, which no one can argue, is that we're in a slump. The capital spending fell off a cliff and that the economy is at best, as President Bush described it today, puttering along at a subpar rate. Years from now, the academicians will decide whether the right word was recession. But I guarantee you, they won't call it a boom. The same obsession with words rather than reality pervades the glum mood of investors today. Is this, for example, really a bear market? Again, it depends on whom you ask. In the tech sector, there is nothing to dispute. It has been not just a bear market for NASDAQ, but a great gnawing grizzly of a market. Elsewhere, though, that's not necessarily the right description. Despite the usual media hysteria based on the sure and familiar knowledge that melodrama in financial matters always gets you bigger headlines than reality. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which used to be what most people thought of as the market, has never entered a bear market in recent years. If you define a bear market by the traditional test of a close that is 20% or more below the previous high. Indeed, despite the widespread misconception that a bearish vote on the Dow in our own ELVES index would finally have been vindicated this past year, and that was the only index in which the ELVES were asked to vote in those days, it simply isn't so. The winning vote in this market for the Dow has overwhelmingly been neutral. That is, a prediction that the blue chip index would move less than 5% in either direction over the next three months. Indeed, the elves voting neutral have won our halos in fully 54 of the past 71 weeks, putting both the bulls and the bears in the shade. So the correct word for the Dow has been a stall, just as the correct word for much of the broader market, notably the smaller stocks, which we'll be discussing with my guest tonight, has been a downright cheerful, baby, look at me now. It may not be much of a consolation to those who still see huge losses in technology and other big so-called growth stocks, which were the market's favorites for so long, but most stocks are actually up for this year. Again, it's your portfolio you should be watching, not your dictionary. Over the years, as regular weekly viewers know, many a guest has volunteered sagely that it was a time for investors to be selective, leading me to wonder irreverently whether there really ever is any other kind of time. 
Regrettably, in handling your money, it's not quite true that sticks and stones can break your bones, but words will never hurt you. But as Eliza sang to us, sensible action can be a lot more useful than endless argument over words. Which leaves us only with the task of finding the right word for the stock market in the week just past. How about tedious? The Dow Jones Industrial Average, looking at mixed but still basically weak economic numbers, an indecisive dollar, and rising oil prices, countered by the prospect for more interest rate relief, finally decided that the right place to go was basically nowhere. So it ended two weeks of gains with a minor 1.5% retreat, keeping it just above 10,400. And there was even less movement in the broader indexes, several of which successfully tested on Tuesday levels not seen since April. The growing evidence that neutrality has been the right stance in the Dow Jones Elves Index won another convert tonight as Bob Stovall ended 18 weeks in the bullish camp and returned to neutral, saying the negative impact of sales and earnings disappointments will be balanced by positive movements in monetary policy, fiscal policy, and inflation trends. The three who get the halos tonight voted neutral three months ago, since when the Dow is down by 3.6%. Bob is also shifting to neutral in our new NASDAQ competition. We just started giving halos for NASDAQ predictions this year and four get awarded tonight to those who voted neutral three months ago, since when the tech barometer has dropped a bit more than 2%. Bonds were mixed, the dollar dropped against the euro but gained against the yen, and gold fell again as it continued to disappoint its die-hard adherents. And for those who really understand human nature, there was further evidence this week that the biggest issue of our times may not be money or diet or sex. It's who's going to control the TV clicker. A burglar who stole a television set from a house in Lyon, France, was caught when he returned to the scene of the crime three hours later because he had forgotten the remote control. I wonder who was channeling him. Well, so Brandy, what's it gonna take to get this market clicking? I think we've got to quit looking at every uh, item that comes out as a ray of hope. In 1990 and 1982, uh, we were in despair about the markets. We still have uh, too much hope and uh, the, the, the hope that this is the indicator, this is the stock which will get us going. Does that mean you think that despair is going to be around for a lot longer? I think it's, I don't think it's going to be an easy recovery. Uh, the attitude seems to be take two aspirin, Mr. Greenspan, and call me in the morning. And I think it's uh, going to be a stumbling, bumbling market. I think there's more issues than just the economy and earnings. What are the other issues? Well, one is the uh, tremendous restructuring we've done to the markets themselves, so from all kinds of regulatory changes. And a lot of uh, trends are coming to maturity. Uh, for example, uh, in 1999, mutual fund activity was equivalent to 45% of New York Stock Exchange volume. Last year's 58%. This means a tremendous amount of trading and activity is being done by people with three most time horizons. What do you think it will take to get genuine rays of hope? Uh, again, I just think it's going to take time and people uh, realizing that the markets don't uh, recover overnight and that uh, we just got to get this sort of uh, attitude of a silver lining out of the way. What should investors do? Should they be selling? Uh, I think this is a good time to sit on the sidelines because this is the first market in my experience which reacts rather than anticipates. So you've got to do something. Look for stocks with dividend yields. Stocks like uh, utilities, couple Con Ed and CMS. Some of the oil stocks, Chevron's around 3%. Some of the REITs. And one of my particular favorites is uh, People's Bank of Connecticut, which yields 6%. You think people might as well get paid while they're waiting? Exactly. Allison Deans, how does it look to you? Well. I don't think we're going to see any type of recovery in corporate earnings until next year. Capital spending is very depressed. Companies still need to bring down inventories. The only thing that's been keeping the market alive has been the consumer. If we continue to see depressed inventory and capital spending trends and people start to lose their jobs, that could be really tough. The funniest thing is, though, it's the consumer and how they handle the tax rebate that could get the capital spending to bottom, inventories to bottom, and we could start to see a recovery in earnings next year, which I think could get the market moving. But just like Laszlo, I don't think the market will move till people see the earnings, and I don't think that's till next year. What's the best thing people could do with their tax check? 
Um, right now, I like some media stocks, AOL, Time Warner, continue to like some financial services stocks, Wells Fargo, Fleet Boston, Enron, I think is a great play on utilities, deregulation. And I'd nibble a little bit within the technology area, applied materials, I think looks interesting. Well, if you're as dubious as you've just told us about the outlook, why would you buy anything? Well, because I tend to look a year or two out, and I think there are some good values out there. I think also interest rates will continue to trend down. So for financial services, they tend to do well in a declining rate environment. Also, don't fight the Fed. I don't see the market going down a lot um, and ultimately moving up. It just is going to take some patience. Well, you've said patience. Uh, Laszlo has suggested it will take time. Patience is never the primary American virtue. How much time, how much patience do you think is going to be required this time? I think people are going to have to start to wait till next year to see really positive returns in mutual funds and in stocks. Well, Ed Brown, now that Laszlo and Allison have cheered me up, uh, can, you, can you add to the euphoria? <laughs> you know, Lou, I think what we're going to need to see is a broad, a large number of companies across a large number of industries reporting a sense that demand, in demand, is proving, is improving for their products. And I think once we see that, we got a couple of small indications this week. PeopleSoft reported very good results. Texas Instruments came out and said, this is one of very few technology companies that said that they see maybe by the end of the third quarter that something will be improving in certain product areas. I've received several calls this week from analysts saying they think maybe by the end of the third quarter the semiconductor uh, orders will be improving. So they're kind of signs of hope, but we're not there yet. Uh, nobody's crystal ball is perfect. The third quarter doesn't look so hot, though. It certainly doesn't. And I think another thing that's happening in this market is traditionally the market has been willing to look ahead, and I think Laszlo said anticipate maybe six to nine months in advance. And I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think maybe three months at most, which says to me, if the economy bottoms out maybe by end of the year, and I think that's quite possible, then maybe we'll see some sign of improvement in the stock market near the end of this year, anticipating improving economy and improving profits maybe by the first quarter of next year. And it would be a shame to buy them now when they're cheap. <laughs> I would actually step forward and do some buying. All righty, and uh, if you want to join the conversation or just to ask a question, it always gives us joy to hear from you here at Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, Let's see how Wall Street's pint-sized companies have been eclipsing their large brethren so dramatically lately that Wall Streeters once again are regarding the little fellows as small wonders. It used to be Wall Street's orthodoxy that small companies outperformed big companies, and over most of the past 70 years, it proved true. A dollar invested in mid-1931 in the S&P index of 500 large companies would have grown by the end of last month to just over $1,200. But a dollar invested at the same time in the Ibbotson Associates Small Stock Index would have mushroomed to well over $10,000. Yet as many a disappointed investor has found, not all small stocks go up, nor does the group itself always outperform. Just look at the widely varying results of recent decades. In the 1960s and 1970s, according to a calculation specially made for us by our friends at Lipper, small cap funds delivered much higher returns than the average stock fund. Yet the reverse was true in both the 1980s and the 1990s. But small stocks have so conspicuously outpaced larger stocks since the start of last year that they are not only well ahead in the new decade, but have now taken the lead for the past 10 years, five years, three years, and one year as well. Is there something in the air that has made small beautiful again? And if so, how long is the comeback likely to last? For some thoughts on that, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, Rick Lane. Rick, welcome. Thanks for having me, Lou. Pleasure to have you with us. Rick Lane is a third-generation professional money manager. And since his 16-year-old son is already investing aggressively online, it looks as if the Lanes may well produce a fourth. Rick's Milwaukee-based FMI Focus Fund has been one of the finest performers in aggressive growth, 
and has beaten the S&P 500 every year since he began running it in October 1997. It gained 23% in last year's punishing environment. Rick